Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. If you played last week's episode all the way to the very end, I mean, after I went bye-bye, and you heard me go, and the number is, I'm not going to tell you. I will tell you today, all right? I'll tell you what the number is that I was referring to in the last episode. We're dealing with Matthew chapter 24, looking at it in a literal interpretation, looking at it exactly for what it says, not trying not to add to it, trying not to take away from it, trying not to jam it into a certain discourse or theology or eschatology uh, or try to wrap it around what it is that we already have preconceived in our minds. And um, last time we dealt with the issue of what I believe very important, the coming persecution. We have examples, and I'm going to start out with that this week and then get into that number. I promise you, I won't let you go without telling you what that number is. But Matthew chapter 24, uh, if we look, verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows, and he's talking about the earthquakes and the pestilences in diverse places and nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then Jesus lays it on us, something that we really don't want to hear, don't want to think that these things can happen, but they do. And remember what I said last time. We're all going to die, everybody. Some die in their sleep. Some die very slowly, very painful, agonizing death. Some people get murdered. Some people have car accidents, any, any types of things. People die. And so if we are given the opportunity, as our Christian forefathers did, had the opportunity to die for their faith, I think we ought to accept that. I think we ought to, in some ways, look forward to it. Let's pick it up in Matthew 24, starting in verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So remember, in this passage, it's telling you several things. Number one, there is persecution coming. Um, the false prophets, I think, are going to lead the charge on this. Love of many shall wax cold. In other words, people's natural love for another human being. You know, if we see somebody fall that we don't know and they get hurt, we want to go to their rescue and, and help them, even though we don't know them. That's a natural affection. But that's all going to be done away with. I think people are going to literally be turned into a beast sort of heart, beast nature, all right? Um, and then it mentions, he that shall endure unto the end. Now, I believe that those who are truly born again, God will give them the strength no matter what happens to them. And I'm going to read you some scriptures on this, that no matter what happens to them, they will endure to the end because God is going to aid them in doing that. They're, they're going to finish the race. They're going to finish the course. They're going to complete it. They're going to have faith, not works. See, this is a what Peter said, a trial, our faith being tried by fire. Not our works, our faith. In fact, let me, um, let me add this passage, just, just what's in my mind. I don't know if I've uh, read this last week or not. Uh, let me go to Mark chapter 4 the parable of the seed and the sower, because it clearly says that um, verse 16, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, 
and have no ruin in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth uh, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And they fall out. They had no root. They had no nothing holding them in. They were a false Christian, false brethren, okay? Wolves in sheep's clothing. They pretended to get saved and didn't actually get saved. They made a big deal about it, had a big thing at the in front of the church, but because they got offended, because they got persecuted, and really, when you look at it, that's the purpose. God has certain mechanisms that he uses to filter out who really is and who really ain't. Pardon my English. But there is going to be a clear definition between who is really saved, those who endure into the end, and those who have just been faking it. And I've talked with families, people, the last several years since we've been doing this ministry from around the world, their family members who they thought were saved, church members, pastors who they thought were saved, boom, gone out into sin, forgotten all about God, in fact, hate God, say they don't believe in God anymore, those things happened. Something happened, they got offended, they got persecuted, and they said, this is not what I want. Joel Osteen promised me I'd be rich, and I'm not rich, so that's a lie, and I'm out of here. Joel Osteen has done his share of harm, and he's going to pay for that, all right? So, let's go now to Revelation chapter 6, and we'll look at another verse in Revelation here in a little bit that will tell us exactly what's going to happen in the future. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. That's also mentioned in Revelation 19. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. These people were slain for the word of God. They were killed for a thought crime. And are we in that world today? Absolutely, it's approaching. Uh, I also want to read Revelation 13 because, um, and this really woke me up one day. I read this chapter, and of course, I've read Revelation 13. Revel I've read the book of Revelation, I don't know how many times. But one day, they just really reached out and grabbed me. And, he's, and it says concerning the beast, in verse 4, And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So we see a line drawn here and we see two parties at war. We see the saints of the living God. And we see the Antichrist with the dragon, the devil, on his side. The false prophet is on his side. Practically everybody in the world is on his side. And one-third of all of the angelic realm is on the devil's side and the Antichrist's side. And the saints of the living God, there really are more that are with us than are against us. So, and I want you to understand this. We will win this war. But you, you, Pastor Mike, you just said that he's going he's to kill some of them. He's going to make war against them and shall prevail over them. And some of them shall be killed. Yeah. That's winning. All we have to do is stand. And having done all to stand. Like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They stood when everybody else fell, were they persecuted for it, for a thought crime, because they didn't believe in that God that Nebuchadnezzar reared up? They were persecuted for that. They were thrown in the fiery furnace. 
God was with them the whole time. Okay? And God will never, ever leave us nor forsake us. So with that in mind, let's look at some examples in the Bible. And what we're going to see is we're going to see how God's prophets, God's people were persecuted. We're, and in these stories, I, I love typology, picture of everything in the Bible. Those who believe and hold to the word of God will be persecuted by those who hate and despise the word of God. They hate it because they don't like what it says. It says they're sinners and they can't do this stuff that they're doing. Well, they want to keep doing it. So they surely don't want anybody telling them, like us, that these things that they're doing are wrong. Sound familiar? You may have run into that situation already. Well, that's how this world is shaping up right now. So we have the Antichrist on this side, persecuting the saints, and we have the saints. And let's look at examples of that. First, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, for then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Now, think about this. Jeremiah didn't actually steal anything from the king. He didn't actually hold a gun or, a, well, he didn't have guns, a sword or a spear to him and say, I'm going to take this kingdom from you and give it to Nebuchadnezzar. Ha, 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 because God told me to. He didn't do anything like that. All he did was say, God's going to take this away from you and give it to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And so for those words that he said, he was thrown into prison because of the word of God. Now, you and I both know there are Christians in this world who believe this Bible and Christians who don't believe this Bible. And God has, like I said, he's got various means of filtering them out, purging the vine, as it were, or the olive tree, taking branches off because of unbelief and grafting branches in because they chose to believe. Jesus' story of I am the vine, ye are the branches. And sometimes the, the husbandman, which is the father, will purge the vine so that it becomes more fruitful. But God has ways of showing who the fake and the phony Christians are. Because the fake Christians will never let themselves be persecuted for believing a book. They never will. They will deny it like Peter did. They will deny it like Saul did. They will reject the word of the Lord Saul could have taken his punishment, but he didn't. He chose not to. He chose to lie about it. And God said he took his mercy away from Saul and would not forgive him ever again. And Saul died in his sins. So God clearly has a way of determining who's right with him and who believes the word and who does it. And Jeremiah, all he did was say, King, this is thus saith the Lord. God's going to take this kingdom away from you and give it to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And for that, he was thrown in prison. First Kings chapter 22, we have the story of Micaiah. Verse 23, Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. Stop right here. In this particular story, Ahab wants to go to war. He's asking, uh, I think it's Jehoshaphat, to go with him. And Jehoshaphat says, uh, I want to hear from God on this. So Ahab brings in his 400 false prophets. They tell him, oh, yeah, you're going to win this thing. It's no big deal. You're the super king. And Jehoshaphat's like, isn't there somebody else that we can call on? Ahab says, well, there's Micaiah, but I don't like him. 
He didn't tell me what I want to hear. So they brought Micaiah in, and Micaiah saw the vision of what had happened in heaven. God said, who'll go and, and convince Ahab to go to war tomorrow because I'm going to have him killed because of Naboth. And so one spirit said this, another spirit said that, and this spirit said, hey, hey, oh, pick me, pick me. I can do it. God's like, okay, what are you going to do? I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. I'll convince him. I want you to think about this. A lying spirit in the mouth of all the preachers right? So anyway, uh, let's read that again. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. But Zedekiah, the son of Chenaanah, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? He's mocking him. And Micaiah said, behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, take Micaiah, carry him back into Ammon, the governor of the city, and Joash, the king's son, and say, thus saith the king, put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and with the water of affliction until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, if thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, hearken, O people, every one of you. Micaiah clearly told him what had happened. Ahab chose not to believe. And remember, all these prophets in the Bible, they're a picture of the Bible, the Word of God. They are a representation of Christ, the prophet, capital P, and they represent the Word of God. And so Ahab had a decision to make. I can either believe what God said, or I can believe what my lying preacher said to me. I think I'll believe what my lying preacher said to me, and I'm going to, put my, I'm going to beat Micaiah in the face, and I'm going to put him in prison. Now, people, when you stand for the word of God, the devil will beat you up. He will. I could tell you stories after story after story about me, about people in this church, about other people that I know, some old stories, some recent stories. I've talked with families that are going through so much right now. Why? Because they believe this book. And they're being persecuted even by their own family members. And that's what's coming. So they did it to Jeremiah. They did it to Micaiah. They did it to Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 4, Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these men were jealous of Daniel, and they thought, We'll get him. We'll get him because he follows his God, will persecute him. We want him out of the way because he's favored by the king and we want his position, his money maybe, or whatever, his power. They're corrupt men. So they made up a law that said, anybody who prays to any other God than the God of our king, they're gonna get thrown into the lion's den. And that is exactly what happened. I always thought that was funny. The fact that they wrote the law, they wrote it under the law of the Medes and Persians, which means it cannot be altered. Even if, once the king seals it, not even the king can change it. So they bring it before the king. King says it's a good idea, signs it, puts his seal on it. Now it's law. Now not even him can break it. So what did they do? Threw Daniel into the lion's den. The king didn't want to do it, but he had to. Law of the Medes and Persians. He was bound by the law. So Daniel spent all night sleeping with lions. Was God with him? Absolutely. Did the lions eat him? No. No, he lived. Because they didn't say he has to be thrown in the lion's den until he's eaten up. They didn't say that. The law said he must be thrown in the lion's den. So he was thrown in the lion's den, laid in there all night. The law was fulfilled. Daniel comes out. And the king threw the guys in that made that law. But it was persecution. For what reason? 
because Daniel believed in God and trusted him. And Daniel, again, the prophets represent the word of God. Acts chapter 12, James, the killing of James and the attempted killing of Peter. For what? Did they molest children? No. Did they kill anybody? No. Were they stealing money? No. Were they uh, rioting? Were they trying to light the county courthouse on fire? No. They just believed in Jesus Christ. And here's what the Bible says, Acts chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to, to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God, unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. So they killed James, the brother, half-brother, James of Joseph and Mary, of Jesus. They killed Jesus' brother. And what did Jesus say? And as much as they've done it unto the least of my brethren, they've done it unto me. They killed James. Then they took Peter and locked him up in prison and was going to wait until after Easter to kill him. But an angel let him out of the prison. And again, for what crime? Nothing except preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Can you, can you see where we're headed in this world? The persecution of people all over the world, of Christians, who believe that sin is wrong, but God is a loving God and wants to save them from their sins. So now, in some places in the world, it is against the law to try to save someone who is living in some sort of sodomite relationship, the Bible calls effeminate, it's now against the law to try to convert them in some places in this world. Huge penalties for doing something like that. People want their sin, and they don't want any preachers telling them that God loves them and God wants to remove them from their sins and take their sins away from them and give them a happy life and give them eternal life in heaven. They don't want that. They choose Satan. They choose the sins. They choose everything that the devil will give them. You know, I don't believe that you literally sell your soul to the devil and that's how you go to hell. You're born going to hell. But I do believe that some people make a conscious decision that they will do whatever a spirit, whatever spirit it is, tells them to do in exchange for wealth, popularity, power, the pleasures of the senses, okay? I do believe that. And because of that, they hate the people who preach the gospel of the love of God. They hate them, and they're going to have them killed. Hebrews 11, we call that the Faith Hall of Fame. It lists all the people in the Old Testament who had, not, not everybody in the Old Testament who had faith, but it gives us a list of these people in the Old Testament who trusted God, who had faith, who didn't, didn't see God yet, didn't see Jesus Christ yet, yet they believed in him. They trusted God. And so Paul, I think he's the one who wrote Hebrews. I could be wrong because his name's not there. 
But anyway, whoever wrote Hebrews is giving a list by name. And then he starts reeling off names after name after name. And then he's, this is what he says. Verse 32, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, not Obama, and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Dun, dun, dun! Yeah, I think that's coming. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, and they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now you can go back and read that passage again to yourself and look at all the things that these people of God, men and women both endured, tortured, tortured, not accepting deliverance because they know that there is a resurrection awaiting them after their death. Remember, we're all going to die, every one of us. How we die. I wanted to be doing something for the cause of God's kingdom. I know in my heart that I don't owe him a debt, but I serve him as if I did because he made me free. And if the world hates him, then the world is going to hate me. And I don't like people hating me. I really don't. It, it really bothers me. It's like a thing of mine. Had it since I was a child. I wanted everybody to like me. But not everybody does. And at some point, I may be delivered unto death for what I say, what I believe, what I preach. I'm scared, but I'm willing. I'm willing. Now, Matthew 23. And what you see is, uh, and I'm going to say this because that's what it is, a Jewish conspiracy to destroy the gospel. Now, I love the Jews. I love Israel. And I'm 100% for them and for their peace and their well-being. But they hate Jesus, and they hate Christianity, hate him. And whenever they're in power, they always try to destroy Bible Christianity. And that's what you have here. That's what you had in the book of Acts, all through the book of Acts, all the persecution that came to Paul and the others, Stephen, by the Jews, okay? Are they the enemies? Yes, absolutely. What are we supposed to do? Pray for them, right? Matthew 23, here's what Jesus said to his own people. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore be ye witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of whom which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. Look at that, A to Z, 
Abel to Zacharias. I just think that's interesting. Whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Man. Jesus has such a heart for his people. But they hated him. And every prophet that the Lord sent, they killed him. Including the prophet, Jesus Christ. They killed their Messiah. The one who came to save them, to rescue them. Like they wanted to kill Moses when Moses defended the Jewish man, murdered the Egyptians. The Jews looked at Moses and said, what are you going to kill us too? Moses had to flee for 40 years because of that. So they hate Jesus. They hate the Bible. And they hate everybody who believes, practices, preaches, teaches what this Bible says. But does God have a purpose in that? I believe he does. Romans chapter 8. I love this passage of scripture. There's a list. And remember what I've always told you. If you see a list of something in the Bible, count the number. Often you will find some great wisdom in that, what it, what it means. So I remember reading this years ago and I went, whoa, there's a number here. And I knew what that number referred to. And I'll show it to you. Are you ready? Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Think about that. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. We know who that is. We wrestle against them. Nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. I love that. Because... I'm like everybody else. Sometimes I get these things where I think God's mad at me all the time, right? That God really didn't save me, that God really doesn't put up with me. I think those things sometimes. And when I think them, I have to go back to the scriptures and tell myself, Mike, that Bible's true. It's never wrong. And no matter what I'm going through, no matter what trial, God loves me with a love that I cannot even comprehend his great love. It's amazing. Did you happen to count? And I know the words there are important. The things that he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword. Who should? You know, these are important issues. So I don't want to detract from what the word is actually saying. But I know that God speaks in order and patterns. And to see and understand that order gives you a little bit of knowledge about how God is going to do things, how God's going to work things out. And again, I want to say to all my brethren that would disagree with me on, the, on this rapture issue about when it happens. I would say at least consider the possibility, maybe even the probability, that God's people are going to be persecuted before we're taken up. Consider that, at least consider that, okay? Think about it. The devil hates us, right? 
Is he going to try to get at us? Well, he's been doing it for years. What makes us think that he won't try some last ditch attempt to absolutely destroy us? I think he will. But let's, let's, let's count. Let me show you. I, I divided it all up. I put it on the screen for you. You see one, number one, who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation. That's one. Two, distress. Three, persecution. Four, famine. Five, nakedness. Six, peril. Seven, sword. And then you keep reading because he doesn't mention anything. And he says in verse 38, for I'm persuaded that neither death, that's number eight, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, powers, things present, things to come, nor height, nor depth, number 17, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 17 things there. What does that number mean? I love that number. It's, it's what I've not spoken about it much, but it's one of my favorites because it's related directly to the translation of God's saints from this world to that world. The dead in Christ first, then we which are alive and remain being caught up together with them. And that number 17 is the number that speaks of that transformation from this body to the new body, resurrection. Genesis 17, okay, the clues are always in the Genesis chapter. Genesis 17, what happened in Genesis 17? When Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And that's in verse 5. 5 is also related to the rapture as well. So the number 17, notice that God changed something. He changed Abram to Abraham, a new name. Think about Saul. The apostle Paul was called Saul. What happened? In Acts 13, they started calling him Paul. He went by a new name because he was changed. All right, you see that? By the way, Sarah as well. In verse 15, which is three times five, God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And it's interesting. I, and I just think about things like this. God took the name Abram and put breath in it because the letter H, or as the British say, H, has a sound. Half, have. Abraham, God's given him a new life, his new breath, new spirit, okay? So that's 17th chapter of the Old Testament. What's in the 17th chapter of the New Testament? That would be Matthew 17. Look at what it says. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, one for Elias. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So, 17th chapter of the Old Testament, Abraham, Abram is changed to Abraham. 17th chapter of the New Testament, and it takes place in verse 5. 
in 17th chapter of the New Testament, Matthew 17, in verse 5, God has already transfigured Jesus. His face is shining as the sun. But then God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And remember, Peter wrote about that in, uh, I think it was Second Peter. Probably take me a long time to find it. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. Hang on, I'm almost there. Um, Peter referenced that when he was talking about the sure word of prophecy. Yeah, here it is. And he said, verse 17, verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. See, I didn't remember that but I have it circled in my Bible because it caught my attention that Jesus was transfigured in, Genesis, in Matthew 17 and in verse 17, Peter was there. In verse 17, Peter says exactly what God said in Matthew 17, verse 5. Mm. And then he said, this voice, verse 18, this voice which uh, came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And it's talking about the sun rising up. Jesus, the sun. And Jesus was transfigured. Matthew 17, his face became like the sun. I love this. I'm, I'm just a little bit happy. So the number 17 and the 17 things that cannot separate us from the love of God. God's going to use those things transform us how do you temper glass or steel put it in the fire put it in the fire cool it down quickly it alters the molecules changes it so that it's tempered transformed first Thessalonians 4 in verse 17 it's where we get caught up. First Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And it's in verse 17. First Corinthians 15, 51 Verse 51, the number 51 is a multiple of 17. It's 17 times 3. And look at what it says. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Transformed and changed in verse 51, which is 17 times 3. Now, let's go back to Genesis 7. What's in Genesis 7? The flood. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24 in relation to all the things that are going to happen? He said, as it was in the days of Noah. The days of Noah. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. What did he mean by that? Well, I think there's probably a lot of things. But let's look at this. Genesis chapter 7. Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. What day did it take place on? The 17th day. Now, why did God have to give us the exact date of the flood. When 
we're not really given the exact date of other things that happened in the Bible. We're given the exact date of the flood. Why did God do that? I don't know, but I do know that that whole thing, as it was in the days of Noah, it took place on the 17th day of the month. But we're not done yet. Because the waters are rising, it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, but the waters after the 40 days keep rising. They keep rising and rising and rising. How long do the waters rise and then they stop and then they start going back down? So how long did that take? Genesis 7 verse 24, and the waters prevailed upon the earth and 150 days. So from the 17th day of the second month, we go forward 150 days, and in Genesis 8, it says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. Look at that upon the mountains of Ararat, and the waters decreased continually until the 10th month, and the 10th month on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountain seen. So, the waters start rising on the 17th day of the second month, and they keep rising until the 17th day of the seventh month, which is five months. See, I see a lot of the, the inner section of the number 17 and the number five. It seems like they both work together to show us God's plan. And all of this goes back to the 17 things that cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 17 things cannot do it. And of those 17 things, persecution is one of them. Now, let's go to the 170th chapter of the Bible. That would be, you can do this, download the Pure Bible Search software, purebiblesearch.com, Windows, Linux, Mac, download it, install it, and find the 170th chapter of the Bible yourself to verify that I'm telling you the truth. It's Deuteronomy chapter 17. Here's what it says. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, which is a picture of heaven, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Now, here's the interesting thing. Moses was the first ruler of Israel. He was a judge over Israel. And we had the time of the reigning of, of Israel. Who ruled over Israel were the judges. Starting with Moses, then you read in the book of Judges, you have Barak, you have Gideon, you have Samson, you have Deborah, you have all of these judges over Israel, and it ends with Samuel. And from Moses to Samuel, there are exactly 17 judges, and then they set a king over themselves. And that was prophesied in the 170th chapter of the Bible, which is Deuteronomy 17. I love, I love my Bible. It's in perfect order. And the more I read it, the more I see the abs, I stand in awe and reverence of this dear book. I love it. Now, 1 Samuel 10. This is when they actually asked Samuel, give us a king. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, 
and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. So God is saying that during that time of the 17 judges, God was saving Israel out of all her what? tribulations let's take a brief brief look at that word tribulation and see what god has in store for his people related to that word matthew 24 21 for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor shall ever be and except those days should be shortened there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. John 16, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Notice that Jesus is telling us, in the world ye shall have tribulation. It's going to happen. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in what? The faith. To continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God must through tribulation but can that separate us from the love of god or any of the other 17 things no look at romans chapter 5 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of god and not only so but we glory in tribulations also Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God, look at that, tribulation can't separate us from the love of God, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 4, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. So, this is a word that I've just encouraged people to look up in the Bible, King James, use the Bible search software or get a strong concordance, and look at every occurrence of the word tribulation or tribulations, there's a plural there, and read those verses. And ask yourself the question, is God telling us that we're not going to have tribulation? I don't believe he's telling us that. I believe that when we are transformed on the day of being caught up, translated into heaven, Jesus appears in the air. I believe that we will have come out of much tribulation in little ways we go through it nearly every week maybe maybe every day but we have trials and tribulations often and what happens is god is trying to get us to trust him and to follow him and to lean on him and know that he's going to guide us and not not steer us wrong and not not let anybody kill our soul. He's not going to let anybody do that. He's our Savior. So, Revelation chapter 7. Now, I'm going to close with this. There are two groups in Revelation 7 that you see. One is clearly 
the Israelites and the tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe, 144,000, and they have the seal of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us that in Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians 1. You're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Then the scene changes in Revelation 7. You have all of the Gentile saints, all of them. And where are they? Around the throne of God himself. And look at what it says. Verse, Re Revelation 7, verse 9. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, there's four things there, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. That, I think that relates to the Feast of Tabernacles. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Seven things. Be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb therefore are they before the throne of god and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them and they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the sun light on them or nor any heat verse 17 for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them in unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Oh, I wish I could shout hallelujah right now. I love that. God is going to deliver his people. And right now, here in America, we're actually starting to see some of that persecution because of this COVID stuff, telling churches that they can't meet, they can't sing, they can't gather, the, gather together. That's against the Constitution. Persecution has already started. And it's going to get worse. And I don't like that. Oh, I'm telling you I don't like that. At all, I don't like that. But I'll, I know that God will bring us through that. God's going to wipe all the tears from our eyes and all the tribulation that we went through and all the 17 things that Paul mentioned in Romans 8. None of those things can separate us from the absolute beautiful love of God who loves me. I struggle with that. I have a hard time. Why does God love me so much? Why does God put up with me? Why does God have long suffering with me? Why does God even have mercy with me? But he does. And I'm thankful. And I plan on following him. No matter what happens. No matter what tribulation, what trials come. No matter how it all works out, I don't know how God is going to do everything. I don't know the day of the rapture. I don't know what's going to happen before, what's going to happen after. I just think these things are going to happen. And I'm ready for it. God will make us ready. And he will cause us to stand in that evil day. Think about it. Pray about it. Think Bible. God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.